Hello and welcome to Heritage Matters. I'm Minnie Mellon. Today we put the spotlight on a period of India's history which we know little of. It's surprising, but the period between 1900 and 2000, the period of the making of modern India, of the shaping of modern India, is not a period historians really look at or anybody looking at history really sees as history. In fact, pick up any textbook and the history really officially ends in 1947 with Jawaharlal Nehru's famous uh, Tryst with Destiny speech at the stroke of midnight, uh, 15th August 1947, that is. And from there on, it becomes uh, the domain of political scientists, economists, sociologists, who then analyze the evolution of India. So at Live History India, we've decided to really act as a bridge between the past and the present, and hopefully allow us to see what the picture is looking like as we move ahead into the future. So starting the 1st of February, that is today, we are going to be looking at the making of modern India, every bit and piece of it. And today's panel actually reflects the wide lens with which we will be looking at this period of history, the period that really shaped India. And it's an amazing journey that's spanning 100 years. And to think of it that in 1900, India was really a subcontinent divided by multiple princely states, was part of the British Dominion. And in 2000, our engineers were sitting and solving the Y2K problem of the world. And Bangalore had become a world center for technology. And the term being Bangalore had had so many connotations. We've moved on from there, but this period of 100 years is truly fascinating. And to discuss this, we have an in-house panel for you. So let me introduce you to them, starting with Sudeep Chakravarti, journalist, author, and somebody who's done some fabulous work on this changing face of India. His latest book is, of course, on Plassey, which is a little bit of a step back. But two of his works on the Naxals and the Naxalbari movement and on the Northeast are really must-reads. And he is going to be the editor of the series and taking us through the different periods and making sure that every week we are reminded of that fabulous journey. We also have Akshay Chavan, who's, of course, uh, my partner in crime in Little History India, the co-founder and head of research uh, an authority on princely India and a very important phase uh, of the 19th century, spilling into the 20th century, that shaped our quality. And we don't think of it uh, like that, but it's really quite fascinating to see how so much of today is shaped by that. I have two other guests, uh, Ganesh Natarajan, uh, who has been part of the Live History India story for some time. He's on our advisory board. He wears many, many hats. Uh, he is, of course, the chairman of YWF. He was the chairman of Social Venture Partners, one of the biggest uh, players uh, working with NGOs uh, and um, you know, uh, uh, people on the ground to solve real problems. And he's also uh, somebody who's uh, you know, uh, written extensively on the interface between technology and policy. So there are a lot of interesting insights from him. And we have Sanjay Sharma, one of the pioneers in India's ed tech revolution, uh, education technology revolution. He's a senior advisor at KPMG. He's done a lot of work around the use of technology to solve problems. And a lot of India's story is about that the leapfrog that we did as far as technology is concerned. So over the next one hour, we're going to tell you why you should be hooked on to the making of modern India on Live History India. So Deep, I'm going to start off with you. We've got a big plan, and I really want you to take our viewers through it because what we've done is really systematically go into it. Not that Live History India was not covering the space, but I think the systematic approach is, uh, is going to be full of insight. Well, thanks, Minnie. And <clears throat> may I just say uh, at the outset how delighted and honored I am uh, to be part of this initiative. I think it's absolutely fabulous. And this comes from a person who is sort of cynical and jaded and ha I've actually done a review of uh, India at 50 in 1997. And I'm so delighted that I'm able to do a recap, if you will, revisit India at almost 75 now. I, I mean, as you know, Akshay, you and I have been talking about this for a while. Uh, I, I think we've all appreciated that India is at a great, great crossroads. Uh, and I think the prime objective of the Making of Modern India initiative is, is, is excellent because this uh, is really a bridge, uh, as we know, between uh, of the past and the present, and hopefully it will uh, offer a bridgehead to the future as well. And uh, the, the idea, I Mini, mean, is to offer perspectives from a, uh, on a wide range of issues, from politics to geopolitics, from the economy to ecology, uh, from information to information technology, to wealth and wellness, to 
uh, actually every aspect of India today and India tomorrow. What we forget, what we usually neglect, is that in this search for the present and the future, even we forget the past, and we we often forget how rooted everything we do today, our entire lives, the way we see our past, the way we are uh, conditioned sometimes to see our present and our future, is deeply rooted in the past. Um, for instance, uh, you know, we we talk about nationalism so much these days, but how many of us remember that perhaps nationalism began in the late 19th century? with the exposition by Dada Bhai Naroji on the drain of wealth. Uh, and he brought this to the British Parliament uh, as an MP, uh, as an elected, uh, as a nominated representative of, of India. And then he worked on the argument and that played into, in some ways, the birth of the Indian National Congress. Uh, and he then became an integral part of the movement. And it sort of snowballed this awareness of the drain of wealth and so on and so forth. And then it led to Mr. Gandhi coming back home, and so on and so forth. I mean, where do I begin and where do I end? It's such a rich uh, tapestry of chronology and events and people and personalities. But unfortunately, uh, some of it is ignored because, uh, you know, in, in the search for instant news of the present day, in this sort of, uh, in the search of manufactured news of the present day, these misrepresentations of the present day, we sometimes, uh, I fear that we lose our rootedness in the past about where we've come from. I believe firmly that this needs to be addressed. And I'm delighted that the primary uh, pivot of the making of modern India is this interrogation, is this questioning, is this looking back at the past to look at look at present. And um, as you, Akshay, and uh, our friends here know that you know we've, we've mapped out very systematically. So I'd like to share this with our viewers and readers as well. Uh, we've brought together, uh, we're bringing together for you over a span of a year, fresh perspectives, uh, thought leaders from India and of Indian origin across the world in every area, fresh, bright young minds who are not afraid to question the past, present or the future. And we're taking these uh, fine people and putting them uh, to, to question various aspects of India. We have about a dozen mapped out. Uh, we'll question the very idea of India. We will be uh, bringing to you discussions on ideologies and identities, caste and politics, and the story of Indian enterprise in so many wonderful ways from information technology to finance to pharmaceuticals, you name it. Uh, debates that help to shape India or have helped to shape India, uh, what I like to call othered India, you know, the, the, the fissures and the fractures of India, which we must, must address. Uh, then. Uh, the Indian diaspora is such an important part of the growth and the evolution of modern India. Uh, the arts and culture, the environment, and of course, to round it all off with what I love to call future history, with all respect to Isaac Asimov. Absolutely, and we will be talking about future history and how things are going to be shaping up uh, as, as we get insights from you. But, you know, uh, just to add to these points, a lot of the problems that we face today, the roots of that, are really in the past. And it's very important to get that perspective and insight from history to really understand and contextualize your world today. And that's a, a very big uh, um, you know, focus area for us. So how we approach uh, looking back is really by looking at now and looking at the issues that we are facing right now and then going back and saying, hey, where did it all start from? So this really combines Sudeep and my work as, a, as journalists and our love for history to really bring this piece together. Uh, Akshay, if I can bring you in here, nowhere is this as evident as in a topic like reservation, the quota system, something which is really divided campuses in India. I've been in discussions where students have gotten up and said, why do we need it? We've got politicians rooting for it. There is a huge divide around this issue, but history allows us to look at it from a very interesting perspective. And one of the stories uh, that we have done in the history in India, which Akshay will tell you about, is how the first idea of reservation really took root. Akshay. Yes. So uh, you see modern India, I mean, I think it is so important is because just what is happening around you and to interpret your world, to interpret what is happening, to interpret India, it is very important to understand because it, it, is, it is just a culmination of... Uh, you know, the, the things which have happened and until today. And one very good example is the reservations. The first, res I mean, it's 
the ultimate irony of history that uh, today the maratha res- the maratha reservation is a big issue in maharashtra and uh, the, uh, it, I mean, the, the, the marathas are fighting uh, in in the it out in the supreme court but the first reservation the idea of reservation was introduced by this very visionary ruler chatrapati shahu of kolhapur the descendant of chatrapati shivaji who felt that uh, uh, you see the non uh brahmanical caste or the non uh, the people who had not been in positions of power what he called backward castes should be given uh, reservations and this whole idea that a certain percentage of seats would uh, should be reserved was was developed at that time and then slowly slowly you know i mean um, ambedkar i mean, I mean there was uh, sayaji rao of baroda and uh, shahu of kolhapur who gave scholarships to a number of uh, so called i mean in those times they were called backward class uh, people and uh, help them to grow and these so these two leaders were the ones who then uh, uh, be, became the the leaders of tomorrow and and you know uh, it it just continued so so and now you know the biggest irony is that uh, at that time when the marathas considered themselves to be the rulers or the the upper caste and this thing and now today they are asking for reservation so to understand i mean uh, it it also brings into question issues like the agrarian crisis which was not there before and uh, even, uh, the prosperity of the 50s and the 60s has given way to uh, to the the abject agrarian crisis of today which is now fueling this anti uh, reservation sentiment so there are many other issues like a, a very small example uh, you know apart from reservation is something like say uh, the taglibi jamaat uh, in uh, 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 delhi which was in uh, this whole uh, uh, during a lot of in the news during the corona virus and uh, you know it was formed uh, uh, in the 1920s and is connected with say the princely state of alwar because there was this uh, meo muslim community which was following 50% hindu and 50% muslim rituals and then there was this competition between the hindu mahasabha and the uh, the taglibi jamaat to make them pure hindus or pure muslim so there are many such strands which uh, we are uh, uh, you know seeing today manifesting today in modern indian politics which have its roots in the events of 1920s and 30s or 40s and if we don't understand uh, what happened then or the roots of it we will not understand what is happening now absolutely it's a fascinating tapestry really of people of ideas of notions of movements that really shaped that very early period and one of the problems is that because the national movement dominates that early part from 1900 to 1947 we've often not looked at these uh, little strands that really went on to shape uh, our our uh, country and our nation You know, Sanjay, one of the interesting uh, uh, people that Akshay mentioned was Sayaji Rao from uh, from Baroda, Sayaji Rao Gaikwad, a fabulous uh, man with great vision who had the ability to pick out winners, if you could say that. So, uh, B. R. Ambedkar, uh, Sri Aurobindo, Raja Ravi Varma, all of these people were mentored by uh, uh, Sayaji Rao. And what's interesting is that people like him realized very early. that education was going to be a very important pillar on which this new nation would stand and that has also held the test of time sandhya because one of the early successes that we got and we don't talk enough of is the sheer ambition with which we set up educational institutions in the first phase under the nehru era where you had institutions which were world class so when homi baba met tifr his benchmark was not from the perspective of a, a new nation developing a new institution no it was creating a center for scientific research which was world class and attracted the best talent in the world from that era we have the iits the iims the great universities like bhu etc so i think we need to stress on the importance of education in our journey shouldn't we such yeah and uh, of course we uh, set up uh, engineering colleges from the mid 19th century beginning with the uh, road key and then uh, the engineering college at pune and then the uh, the three main presidencies set up engineering colleges and of course later even as the century was uh, opening uh, jamshedji tata set up the indian uh, 
ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട് ഓഫ് സയൻസ് ഇൻ ബാംഗ്ലൂരു സോ ദസ് ബീൻ അ ലോങ് ഹിസ്റ്ററി ഓഫ് ഹയർ ഇൻ ടെക്നിക്കൽ എഡ്യൂക്കേഷൻ ദാറ്റ് വാസ് ദെൻ ആക്സലറേറ്റഡ് ആഫ്റ്റർ നയൻറ്റീൻ ഫോർട്ടി സെവൻ and this also produced a generation of uh, technocrats uh, who ca- went on to a uh, kind of build great companies uh, so uh, let me get ganesh in here ganesh uh, it's very interesting that you know one of the big success stories of india is this uh, technological revolution that we saw starting the 1980s largely fueled by these uh, indians who went to engineering colleges like sandhya said went to great academic institutions and were you know globally benchmark so to say Uh, how would you see that very formative period in the shape of it? So you're right, Mini, because, I mean, if you really look at the history of IT services in this country, it was started by one gentleman who left uh, one of the Tata Group companies and set up Tata Consultancy Services, Mr. Fakir Chankoli. And I think what FCK saw in the early days was the potential of taking very bright engineers, um, B-Techs and M-Techs, and maybe sending them off to the America to do some great technology work. and from there the good news is that this industry has really grown because if you look at why we have one industry which has 55% global market share it's because of the continuous evolution of this industry it started with mr kohli identifying the intelligence of the indian programmer it moved on to people like mr narayan murthy and mr azim prem ji discovering that it's not just the programming intelligence but the ability to innovate around a business model the whole offshore outsourcing as we call it today which is what set up which is what created the bangalore phenomenon that you alluded to right in the beginning of this program we got boast of campuses which were par excellence and we are really finding that this is what is enabling this whole industry to grow and from there we evolved into becoming players in innovation so we moved from business model innovation to process innovation to product innovation and one of the reasons today that this industry is now so widespread i mean if you look at the quarterly results this quarter in many many industries the top two players are doing well because they've kind of accumulated market share but if you look at the it sector almost every company is reporting record results because we are capitalizing not only on the benefits of growing economies we sometimes capitalize even on the problems of economy right because as they reduce their budgets we get more of it as they increase their budget so i think it's a phenomenal an area that we are looking at i really hope that as we go along other industries i mean right now six of us are writing a book on the economic asymmetry between india and china and if you look at 14 15 sectors there's huge amounts of catching up to do i mean i think the pharma industry took on what the it industry had done today we are seeing the auto components industry but there are so many many industries where if you really can put india on the world map you will not only solve the problems of industry you will solve the problems of a country which is struggling to find its feet you know using a wide lens to look at the making of modern india and looking bridging those gaps those traditional gaps between uh, you know politics and business between bombay and delhi and bangalore and looking at it as a single whole actually gets you a lot of interesting perspectives because it also frames for us the problems that we face as a country and so that we get you in here because you know while we created great institutions today we are also Uh, abysmally low in terms of world rankings as far as our academic institutions go there's a huge brain, brain drain that is hap- happening in a different context today as young students are going to universities abroad to study so there are a lot of issues which we hope to also address in this kind of uh, you know a uh, framework that we are looking at in the making of modern india but i would like to talk about the last year gone by the covid year you know it also brought to uh roost a very very fundamental problem of inequity because look at what technology did for students last year right they got the entire education system online and yet there were a lot of students who fell off the radar because they didn't have access to it so increasingly is it going to be technology that is going to be driving it and what are the lessons from this period of technology transforming us uh, an area like education is that uh, yeah. for me yeah. yeah so i think there have been huge strides uh, in, uh, in in the way we uh, can learn and obviously uh, uh, digital uh, classrooms have been around now for uh, well over a decade uh, but 
today a lot of content is is uh, is available on uh, smartphones and uh, you know while you're talking of the digi- uh, di- digital divide uh, and that's absolutely true uh, but uh, still more and more content is available on uh, on phones uh, today so i'm hopeful that uh, as the next few years go by uh, some of the divide would actually get uh, addressed by so much content being available on uh, on phones and uh, uh, we are, we are seeing uh, uh, a number of uh, schools uh, can operate uh, quite effectively uh, because uh, uh, some of the classes and some of the content is being uh, uh, shared on schools but obviously uh, when you look at um, the more remote areas and uh, uh, schools uh, in, uh, in in uh, rural areas uh, there the students don't have uh, phones and so definitely the divide is big but i feel that uh, given the way mobile technology is spreading the divide could actually uh, uh, become smaller in the next few years that's disrupting businesses and how right so uh, so we that brings us to future histories but we i will uh, park that thought aside but, you know it, let's talk about the divide you know I mentioned, you know, we've both been journalists. Uh, I think 90% of our coverage outside election season or budget season is normally limited to Delhi, Bombay, and Bangalore. And that's a real shame in a country as vast as us. You know, you have traveled across, you've uh, covered, as I mentioned, the Naxalbari movement and uh, the Northeast. Uh, um, you know, you've done a, a, a fabulous book on that. I want to talk about how we're going to be looking at regional history, regional politics, regional evolution, because that's really something that we need to focus on because there's so little work being done. I agree, uh, Mini, and thank you for focusing on this. And I say this as a person who believes fervently in, uh, in equity. And, I, and I, I'll posit two things with you. Uh, one is the aspect of the Naxalbari revolution, which morphed into the Maoist rebellion of the present day. And I'll speak very briefly about the Northeast. I believe it is a the, uh, you know, it is a matter of grave concern that uh, 54 years after the Naxalbari movement kicked off in May 1967, when we were approaching the 75th anniversary of India's independence, and uh, India's attempts to sit at the you know the global table of power and you know, whatever we, and, and geoeconomics, whatever you have, there must be a structural deficiency of some sort of uh, you know of misunderstanding or deliberate misunderstanding or maybe simply poor governance that permits a movement a militant movement that began 53 to 54 years ago to persist in 2021 we must own up to some structural uh, you know sort of uh, malaise uh, which is deeply rooted in our understanding or lack of understanding of what i'd like to call other india or uh, you know, when we, we need to break out of our mall stupor of what I call inland to look outland, uh, you know, places that are out there, out of sight, and therefore conveniently out of mind. So, you know, uh, uh, to my mind, many, the, the, the persistence of militant extremism, left-wing extremism, is, is built on rights as guaranteed in the Constitution of India and made through election promises year after year by our political leaders and our bureaucratic leaders. And um, they're just not being delivered upon. Other, I mean, if there was uh, governance, then there would be no reason for anybody to be angry with the state of India. Look at what right to information has done. Uh, it has singularly contributed to my mind for the need to pick up weapons against the Indian state. So if you give people rights, if you give people identity and awareness, you don't need to. And I think we need to look very deeply at that. The, the Maoist rebellion, many went across 14 states at one point. Imagine, we are at 30 states. It went through nearly half of India's states. You can't ignore it as, as, and brush it away with the nomenclature of urban exiles and what have you. We have to look at it very, very seriously in order to, to take people with us. Uh, when people disagree or want something, we can't throw the book at them or throw the gun at them, which has happened, in, for instance, in northeastern India. You know, uh, before 1947, you could go from Kolkata to Agartala in Tripura. You could go by boat from Dhaka to Guwahati, up the river, Brahmaputra, take a ride and reach Guwahati, the Brahmaputra River, the same river that flows to the west of Dhaka by another name. 
uh, you could crisscross the northeast. It was uh, an enormously connected commercial people communication enterprise that that, that just grew over decades. Forty seven cut us dead. Uh, you could no longer go from Calcutta to uh, Agartala. The distance went from 500 odd kilometers to 1500 odd kilometers, 2000 odd kilometers. It was, we are connected to Northeast of India, thanks to partition by something called Chicken's Neck. It's 24 kilometers across. And it is as if with that overnight dislocation of this vast uh, aspect of India, one seventh of our landmass and nearly 50 million people, it is as if they no longer existed, which again, brought issues of New Delhi not caring about what happened beyond, uh, say, Calcutta. Everything east of Kolkata or Calcutta was alien. And that led to several administrative issues, governance issues, identity issues in northeast of India. And you had a mushrooming of rebellions. You've had a mushrooming of militancy. So it's all very simple. It's all very logical. I mean, it's, not, uh, it's literally not rocket science. And I wish that we have the, and I'm so happy that we have the opportunity to interrogate these histories and present it to our readers and viewers. Absolutely, and systematically going through periods, regions, ideas, Indeed. Uh, events, Indeed. is I think going to be very, very important to really make sure that nothing slips between the stools, so to say. Because in a country as large as ours, with so many issues, I mean, it's often <coughs> easy to overlook a particular region, overlook a particular issue, but these are, issues that are shaping our today and are going to shape our future. So extremely important. Uh, Ganesh, uh, as I like saying, we are a country which is going to become a third uh, largest economy of the world by 2022 or some such year when we become 75, I guess. And we also have third world problems. And I think you sit very uh, easily bridging these two gaps because on one hand, you're hanging out with Silicon Valley kinds and you know unicorns and technocrats. On the other, you're working on the ground with people uh, for whom the basic needs have to be met. Of course, technology and, and uh, the capital is going to be a big uh, help, but the basic issue of government, you know, because actually if you look at it, if you actually enumerate the number of um, policy interventions that have happened, and so we, we must do that at some stage, as far as rural livelihoods are concerned, as far as education is concerned, as far as insurance and healthcare are concerned, I, I'm sure there are hundreds of them. But Indeed. the big issue is how does it reflect on the ground? What is the change that has happened on the ground? And why is it taking so long for, uh, for change to happen? Absolutely. Well, I think if you just uh, look at what you said, Mini, and uh, also reflecting back on what Sanjay said about the asymmetry of education in urban centers and rural centers, uh, I'll just take you back maybe three, four years when some of us worked with the government, the Ministry of IT and McKinsey Global Institute to create this whole vision called the trillion dollar digital India. I mean, as all of us know, Prime Minister Modi has been talking about the $5 trillion GDP economy. And thanks to COVID, that's going to be probably pushed out by a few years at least. But I think the trillion dollar digital India holds the keys to what we can be as a nation and what can we can mean to the world. I mean, let me, let me paraphrase this one. If you look at the singular success stories of digital India, one of course is the industry. You alluded to that earlier, we talked about it. The $190 billion industry will easily grow to 350, 360 billion, maybe by 2025. So where's a trillion going to come from? The balance six, 600 or 650 billion is going to come from IT enabled host of services. I mean, we're talking about the shared economy today. And what we have seen with Nanda Nilakani's Aadhaar, and of course, what the government now calls the jam trade, uh, Jandhan, Aadhaar and mobility, I think that can transcend sectors. So tomorrow you will have education, agriculture, e-commerce, even employment exchanges, all enabled across India. Where we could fail and which is where policy becomes extremely important is the connectivity across the country. Even today, I'm sure where Akshay is sitting, somewhere near Jhansi, you're not going to get great internet if it even travels 10 kilometers from there. And that's the problem. Because unless 260,000 gram panchayats and hopefully 700,000 villages Get, collect, get connected with technology and have Wi-Fi connectivity, you will have that asymmetry continue for education, for agriculture, for everything. So I think the key to what you're saying is in policies like the National Network. I mean, NOFN was talked about five years back. It became something called Bharat Net. Policy has again now changed it to NOFN. And in fact, uh, Prime Minister Modi alluded to National Optic Fiber Network in his Independence Day speech. And 
very hopeful because the nothing succeeds like access to use a whole old cliche but the minute everybody in this country has access to information and not just for rti as sudeep mentioned but information that will help them to become more digitally savvy could actually have entrepreneurial micro entrepreneurial services on the internet i think that's the future of this country and i am very hopeful that right what it brought we call the physical infrastructure digital infrastructure social infrastructure happening in the country and these problems we have about you know a completely crazy distribution of jobs with a huge concentration in urban locations you distribute the jobs you give people access let them get a livelihood and then suddenly you will find that you know supply chain centers are happening all over the country and then we can be the supply chain center not just for india but for asia but for the and for the rest of the world and i think that's the kind of india that you know as learning from the last 100 years of history we need to build in the next 10 years and that's the history of the future we'd like to see it there's no success like access what a wonderful line i'm going to use it somewhere again thanks for that but uh, you know uh, sanjay uh, you know we need to frame the questions and issues that we face in the country i really want to stress on three four areas you know uh, ganesh spoke about access going back to the quality of roti kapra makan healthcare education these fundamental issues that are driving people out of india are are constantly uh, sore points for anybody living in any city any uh, small town in india these are real challenges so uh, you know i'll i'll give you one very interesting statistic which i got from arvind panakia's book india unlimited a fantastic book on reclaiming the lost glory but you uh, you'd be amazed that 84.2% of our enterprises in 2015 2016 were own account enterprises which meant that they did not hire anybody from outside they were really mom and pop shops just 17% of our manufacturing actually happens in companies which hire more than 200 people can you imagine that i mean that just shows the scale of the problem we have not generated great jobs big jobs manufacturing jobs i mean you spent a lifetime at the tata as one of the great success stories of india subject and hence i want to ask you is it time to stress on these issues of roti kapra makan nokri healthcare education Absolutely, and I think uh, the organized sector has never been uh, 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 a very big proportion of uh, uh, jobs uh, in India, and I, I feel that uh, uh, it's it's uh, very unlikely to be uh, the the job growth and uh, the, that could come could be from startups, uh, but it could also come from a whole range of uh, uh, other small businesses, which is exactly what you are. uh pointing out so digitally uh, set up businesses uh, uh startups of various kinds so the economy would look very new and i feel that uh, the the traditional large organization uh based employment uh, which has not been significant uh, for us is not likely to be significant uh, in the future too so you know that brings us to the framing the issues and that's how we are going to be doing it very really looking at the wider spectrum but another very important reason for doing making of modern india so deep and upshare from my point of view is the misinformation that we are getting uh, and uh, the attempts and especially like uh, we call uh, the the university of whatsapp really the the misinformation that is being uh, spread through it a uh, bunch of lies you know uh, really questioning all the very basics uh you know uh that we stand for as a nation so i'm going to say that one of the underlying themes of this entire exercise of making of modern india is to revisit the principles with which we started and also put it out there as is without biases with insights and deep uh, fact checks right uh, so deep so i want to really talk about this because i think this is a very uh significant yeah. danger which is uh, kind of not visible but is possibly going to do huge damage if we don't arrest it i agree completely mini and uh, you know i just give you two small examples using the present day present day events uh, it, it is extremely important for instance let take the uh, you know as we as we speak uh, the agitation over agriculture uh, agricultural markets these have roots that go back decades these have roots that go back to the beginning of the previous century uh and these have multiple perspectives i mean the farmers have their perspective uh, a farmer in bihar will have a slightly different perspective than the perspective in punjab and they'll have different histories to arrive at these two different perspectives 
the agricultural economist sitting in the planning commission or elsewhere, or the Ministry of Agriculture or the Ministry of Finance, will have his or her different perspective. I mean, we need to put uh, it all together and, and, and trace where these perspectives have come from in order to present, I hate to use the word, but I'll use it, a holistic picture of what making of modern India is all about. The other aspect is, you know, India's a small uh, intervention here, is about how this patriotic upsurge over another aspect that happened recently over the past one year is India's tensions with China. I mean, this goes back to before India's independence. It goes back to the British Empire's interaction with Russia, with, with China, with pre-communist China, with the Kingdom of Tibet, and then with its own aspirations in Asia. So, you know, it, it was written down for us, if you, if you will, even before uh, Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai. And, you know, we need to bring in several voices to discuss this aspect and to even bring in uh, so many voices of the present day to look at the past. So I agree completely with you, and I'm there with Akshay on this very much so that we need to, uh, and this is our attempt. I think this will be a great contribution, I believe, and I fervently hope to break through these sort of uh, illusions that are uh, uh, perpetuated by WhatsApp University and social media and IT cells of various parties and various propaganda organizations. This, I think, will be a great contribution that we should and we ought to be making for the making of modern India. Right, uh, Akshay, we have to talk about the patron saint of a lot of the WhatsApp forwards <laughs> that we see, <laughs> especially around the era, area of history. It's a modern um, uh, concept, you know, of course, uh, the internet uh, and WhatsApp led uh, uh, the viral stories that go around. But PNO, we've done a fabulous story on PNO. And I don't know how many times that whole issue of Taj being a temple keeps cropping up. And every time it does, I think of Pian Oak and the many, many stories he's spun. So it's very important to put out facts over there. Yes, uh, you know, Pian Oak is one of my favorite stories because I think almost 90% of the fake history, um, you know, going on the internet from the Taj Mahal or uh, the, the things related to Kaaba or a lot of outlandish things which have been circulated on the internet come from this one single man. Now, you know, what is so interesting about it is we keep cribbing about University of WhatsApp, University of WhatsApp, but it is not, uh, it, it is a bit of a misnomer. And I'll, I'll tell you the reason why. You know, Sanjay and Ganesh uh, you were know, very optimistic about the uh, uh, access to the phones and knowledge reaching people and connectivity and all of that. But one crucial element which is missing in, in Indian education and Indian history is critical thinking. Now, PNO was, so it is, it is not that, you know, the, all these, this fake history has come out from nowhere with WhatsApp. It was always there. He wrote pamphlets and this was the Kahi Suni, what you gossiped, you know, your neighbor, your uncle G while having chai told you, you know, in having this conversation. Now, when internet first started, I definitely, I mean, I clearly remember this. I mean, when uh, I first got an inter internet connection, there was a, uh, there, there was no Google, but there was, there were these uh, Netscape Navigator and those geo sites, but there was an HTML website dedicated to PNO. Can I have read it? This must be 1999, 2000, where all these outlandish theories about Taj Mahal, Jawaharlal Nehru, Kaaba, everything was there on the internet. <laughs> it, it, it just changed, changed the medium. I mean, with with uh, with the advent of the smartphones and with social networks, then it went to uh, Facebook. Now it has come on WhatsApp. Tomorrow, a new medium comes. If there is virtual reality, these fake histories, these myths and all will be there. So the important issue is critical thinking. And second is, I mean, why do people believe so many things they do about Nehru or Indira Gandhi or a lot of things about our history? Because most Indians don't, are not aware of what happened after 1947. Our history stops at 1947. There is now, right now, there is so much of conversation going on about Khalistan and Khalistani flag and this and that and all of it. How many people actually know what, uh, what I mean, how many of them were actually even born when, when this whole Khalistan uh, fighting was happening? So it is, so, you know, the making of modern India is so important because you need to put out facts and a well-rounded uh, information so that at least 
you, this you know you put in a seed that will help them uh, start critical yeah. thinking and all or else it will just go on i mean having the best technology in the world and the best connectivity in the world will 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 be of no impact absolutely this critical thinking is at the very core of what we are doing at making of modern india because i couldn't agree more i mean in fact this is almost like an internal editorial discussion that we are having between sudeep akshay and me but this is what we talk about every day the fact is that uh, you know i think we are a great nation a great civilization with people who have no understanding of history or a very limited understanding of history and i think we are to blame and i think it is important for us to put facts out there to understand history not be so emotional about it that you you know lose all context of reason of contextualization because at the end of the day it is as somebody very famously said a laboratory of human experiments and it's important to understand what our journey was to really understand where we go so uh, while discussions like this end with great optimism ganesh uh, in in uh, the spirit of critical thinking uh, i think what we should also look at that the last round of questions for all of you is what are the concerns really you know for me the concern is a nation not knowing the great principle a lot of people died to create this nation a lot of people gave up their lives and a whole lifetimes work to create this nation are we cognizant of the kind of sacrifices that were made principles with which we stood and even today internationally there are certain values that we as a country as a nation are are known for gandhi is perhaps our greatest mascot as a nation i mean i think it's very important to sometimes revisit the very essence of the making of a nation to understand how far we have veered off course and what needs to be done to come back on course and really address these issues because most often ganesh i feel that these are issues you know roti kapda makan healthcare education rozgar these are issues that only come up during elections you know uh, and these are issues again the media focuses only during elections the rest of the time we are always bickering you know most often in public uh, forums so it's important and if we don't do it you know there is a lot of risk out there so i would like to end with what is it that worries you and what is it that gives you hope uh, when we are looking at a broad spectrum like this ganesh see let me let me give you a slightly contrary in point i mean i mean we all know what it takes to put man on the moon i mean there is a saturn 5 rocket it kind of falls back to earth and then there is a second stage and then there is a third stage and finally there is a little thing that lands on the moon it owes a lot to the saturn 5 rocket but it's not the saturn 5 rocket that will get it to the moon so the point i'm making is that by all means we should in history but we should not get so caught up in the hubris of history that we don't evolve and go forward i mean you mentioned roti kapda makan many times i mean i our first visionary in the it industry devang mehta added two words to it he said roti kapda makan bijli or bandwidth because he realized even in the 70s that look if the future of india is uncertain so the point i'm making is it's extremely important for a new generation to stand up and say look i appreciate what everybody did for me in the past i appreciate the glorious history right from the ramayana and the mahabharat to mahatma gandhi to jawahar lal nehru to what is going on today but what i'm going to build is a new india and i'll just kind of give you a little anecdote i mean recently and the best metaphor to use is cricket and if you remember the exciting fifth day of the last test match when india won my friend amol palekar who and more or less we see Uh, we see cricket together, all, albeit at a distance. So I was WhatsApping Amol and said, "Look, I hope these guys put their heads down and draw this game." And Amol was quick to respond, saying, "Are you crazy, Ganesh? This is the new India. They're going to go out and win this game." And he called me after we after they finished and said, "Look, did you see what happened?" The point I'm making is, let's by all means learn from history because, as people always say, if you don't learn from history, you're condemned to repeat it. But let's move on from that. i think there is a huge way to go i mean as i think we all know in 1980 india and china were more or less similar economically today we are talking about an order of magnitude difference we have to address those differences we have to use the spirit of i think the demographic dividend we have to take this forward so i completely agree with sudeep i mean this is something that we are doing between us and che and you mini which will put everything in context but having developed the context let us use it as a saturn five and let's move forward to create an india which is beyond maybe even our own imagination today but is not beyond the imagination of youth and i think that's what i'm looking forward absolutely that's a great way of putting it future history is the 
shape of things to come and how it's going to be determined. Uh, and that can be done only with the understanding of the past and understanding of our journey, but also with the uh, inspiration that this nation should actually uh, uh, imbibe in everybody. Uh, Sanjay, what are your views? Closing comments. So I think given so much fake news, uh, one thing that will uh, need to evolve is trust-based uh, uh, positions for media, for even people like us, if we are uh, talking about history stories. Because in a world where uh, there's so much misinformation, uh, you would people would go towards uh, those sources of information that would be uh, trustworthy. And it, it, it is... Uh, it, it, you know, it's obvious that there's a huge amount of uh, fake stuff, but still, when you look at something like Wikipedia, it's uh, on on the whole, it's pretty good. I mean, you don't trust everything that is written in a, a wiki article, but it gives you enough facts for you to do at least one stage of your exploration of that particular topic. So, I think this trust-based positioning uh, is going to be very important. Right. And that's what we have been trying to do at Livispedia for the last four years, right? Uh, really yeah. walk the tight path of uh, unbiased, uh, you know, the overly opinion-driven kind of uh, uh, analysis of history that is uh, so, so common to uh, really get the best minds together, to get right. expert opinion, to get data-backed information, and really make that effort and take that effort to dig deep and get you the right perspective uh, and the most informed perspective on events and uh, issues. So we are superbly uh, excited, uh, supremely excited uh, to be uh, uh, embarking on this journey. Uh, it's going to be quite a long haul, 19 months a week. We're going to be counting down to uh, 15th of August, uh, 2022, when India turns 75. There are many, many projections of India. I've been on a national panel on India at 75 as well. So there's a lot of interesting things, but I think nobody's actually attempted to look back and look at the journey. So very, very excited. And uh, we've got a very uh, um, extensive uh, kind of rollout of articles and uh, films and uh, interviews. So we took quickly a recap on that. Mini, I'm supremely excited. And I, you're right that you know, it's going to drive me crazy for the next year and a half. But, uh, the, the, you know, the joy of something like uh, when, you, when you do stock taking at a, at, a, at a moment like this and, you know, with our friends and colleagues here talked about future history and how we should look ahead. It, it's so exciting because this perspective is very, very necessary. I'll give you a tiny example. When I was uh, putting together uh, an editorial uh, uh, perspective for India at 50 in 1997, uh, you know, it, it, when, when we went and talked about how the map of India might change shortly. I got laughed at and I got yelled at by uh, people who had commissioned that piece from me. But three years later, you had three new states which we'd projected, been projecting for years. You had Jharkhand, you had Chhattisgarh, right? And you had Uttarakhand. Now, who is to say Vidar won't happen two years, three years later? Who is to say uh, there won't be a reorganization of Northeastern India? In, within the last year, you've had a reorganization of Jammu and Kashmir, for heaven's sake, which, which follows a sort of a Andorra plan, which the RSS has actually been talking about for the last 50 years. So, you know, when these are exercises, these are in matters of stock taking in business and politics, in society, in ethnographic ways, in linguistics, in arts and culture, in climate change, it's a very, very uh, important part that we'll be looking at uh, for the future. Our geopolitics, uh, in, in 1997, our neighbors w seemed to be uh, a little more sedate in some ways, a little more active in other ways. In 2021, 2022, our relations with our neighbors, we realized more and more how their histories have imp impacted on our history and how our histories are impacting on theirs. It is a, we have to, at, uh, when we're looking at the making of modern India, we're looking at the making of modern India within itself and with India and the world. It's, it's supremely exciting uh, in every manner, and I can't wait, my, I can't wait to, for the rollout to begin, Mini. Fabulous uh, pieces. And like Living History India, we've really created a huge network of contributors, journalists who worked on the ground, authors, experts, historians, a really fascinating array of people who will be contributing to this exercise because it can't be an exercise 
by, uh, that comes out of one mind. It has to be a joint effort, which brings mm-hmm. the best together. So uh, wonderful to have all of you. And uh, let's hope uh, we, uh, we have a great uh, series. And also we should reconnect somewhere down the line with all of us sitting in different parts of India and really reflecting on the journey that we have been on. Now, thank you so much, Ganesh, Sankar, Akshay, and Sudeep. And thank you, our viewers, for really reposing your faith in us and uh, uh, sending us so much of love every day through your mails. And let's hope you enjoy this as much as you've enjoyed this stream also.